Hello friends, this is Jane Curcio back with Breaking Bread for You with the remake of a study I did two years ago on the significance of the miraculous catch of 153 fish from John's Gospel. And I'm doing that in response to a number of comments I've received from those who have used the gematria, the Jewish mystical form of numerology, to determine its meaning. So we are going to examine this episode in the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth using traditional means of exegeting the passage and the gematria in order to find the most likely message that the Apostle John conveyed to his audience concerning the number of fish caught that day. And let me begin by saying that this wasn't the first miraculous catch of fish recorded in the Gospels. For at the very beginning of Jesus' three and a half year ministry, after preaching to the people from a fishing boat, he ordered its owner, Peter, his brother Andrew, and James and John Zebedee and their boat to set out into the deep water after an unsuccessful night of fishing. And I quote from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, where it says, beginning in verse 6, And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. In verse 10, Jesus said, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And it was due to that first demonstration of Christ's power that the four Galileans walked away from their fishing business to follow him, to be discipled, to evangelize lost sinners. So bear this in mind, for you will see that the second miraculous catch of fish at the end of Jesus' ministry was a reinforcement of that call. Noteworthy is that when Simon Peter realized that Jesus was a man of God, he becomes self-conscious of his not-so-godly state, even evident in the second miraculous catch of fish three and a half years later. And beyond the first miracle, having walked away from their families, livelihood, community, and all else that they left behind to follow Jesus, was extraordinary, miraculous in itself. That all said, let's take a look at the second miraculous catch of fish that occurred following Christ's resurrection, his third post-resurrection appearance recorded in John's Gospel, the setting of which was, again, on the shore of the Galilee, also following an unsuccessful night of fishing. Beginning in verse 1 of John chapter 21, it is written, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, We are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Discouraged from the absence of their beloved rabbi and not knowing what direction they were to take, seven of the disciples decided one day to return to fishing, where they encountered the post-resurrection Christ. And it can be safely said that having caught nothing all night was the Lord's doing, setting them up for an object lesson, that failure comes as a result of doing things independent of Christ and his will and his purpose. And in verse 4, John continued to report, When the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. Notice here that Jesus calls them children, pedion in Greek, expressions of affection and or their spiritual immaturity. 
And in verse 6, it continues to read, And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples did ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Verses 1 through 14. So when Jesus told them to cast their net on the right side of the boat, it can be taken that he meant it as an object lesson, the right side in the metaphorical sense that when things don't work out as they ought to, try the right approach, the better way, the way Christ leads. Further, since the disciples were trained to evangelize lost sinners, the other side of the boat can be analogous of evangelizing other peoples besides Jews, the Gentile nations. Based on the number of fish having been so great, it can simply represent the great number of those evangelized beyond what the first century apostles could harvest in their lifetime. All who would hear the gospel and receive Christ as their Savior from that time to the return of Christ. Much has been considered over the centuries in regard to the significance of the number 153. And rightfully so, given that John remembered it many years later when he recorded it in his episode. Uh, unfortunately, he did not reveal the meaning of the number, perhaps since his audience would have taken for granted what it represented. Now, many have looked to the gematria, the mystical system of numerology used by Jewish adherents to the Kabbalah that originated from Assyrian mysticism in which numerical values are assigned to each letter of the alphabet. And using this numerological system, some have found that the title B'nai Ha'Elohim, Hebrew for the sons of God, equates to the number 153. However, using a standard gematria chart, I found that the numerical value is 667, far from the 153. And they arrived at the number 153 through the misspelling of Elohim, taking the final letter to be a mem that has the gematria value of 40, which when added to the numerical values of the other letters of the phrase, results in 153. However, Elohim does not end with a mem, but with a mem soffit, used at the end of a word, which results in the gematria value of 600 instead of the 40, with a total value of 713. Some argue that the sentence, I am Elohim, is also equivalent to 153, but again, that is based on the misspelling of Elohim, which adds up to 713 as well. For me, the gematria is an occultic practice under the guise of religion. Therefore, I cannot use it to interpret scripture. And it's always wise to examine the source of any belief system, which in the case of the gematria is Greek paganism, much of which had been practiced to one extent or another by Hellenized Jews. And I must be asked, if the Kabbalists haven't gotten Jesus right, why would we rely on their methodology to interpret God's word?
Conversely, the most sound method of interpreting the scriptures is by the scriptures. If the writer does not provide an explanation, we need to search the scriptures for precedents and similarities in order to discover the most plausible answers. The fact that some of Jesus' parables were explained to his disciples assures us that the explainable can be explained and that we need to struggle with the difficult text until we find the answers. Now, since there was no meaning given for the 153 fish in the passage, many have opted for the most simple interpretation as mentioned above, that the great number of fish caught that day represents the greatest amount that they had ever caught, which had resulted from a miracle. Yet another popular theory is that the number 153 represents the people who were blessed by Jesus of Nazareth through healing, deliverance, or being raised from the dead. It has been calculated from Mark's Gospel that in various ways there were three people blessed. Matthew's Gospel has 47, Luke's Gospel 94, and John's Gospel 9, adding up to 153 individuals blessed by Jesus in one way or another, at least said that had been blessed by Jesus in one way or another. However, this excludes the thousands who were blessed in the two miracles of loaves and fishes, and the many children who were blessed by Jesus. And according to John, there were many others blessed, but not accounted for due to the lack of space, John 21:25. Yet it is to ask, why would the number of fish represent the past works of Christ when his focus at the time of the second miraculous catch was on the future of his church? And one of the most interesting theories of the meaning of the 153 has been proposed by commentator Bob Stein who argues that John was appealing to Greeks with that number since they would have associated it with wisdom. And we know that the ancient Greeks sought after wisdom, as the Apostle Paul indicates, 1 Corinthians 1, 22. Stein points out that their most revered mathematician, Archimedes, was known for his 10 impressive equations that all ended with the number 153. And while not easily recognizing the wisdom of the gospel of Christ, the Greeks might have been drawn to it through the connection to Archimedes' mathematics. Yet this theory supposes that John used the number 153 uh, that caught that day due to its relationship to Archimedes' calculations. This insinuates that John lied and attempted to manipulate the Greeks into receiving Christ as Savior. But this would have been out of character for John, who wrote, But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. Revelation 22.15 Others suggest that the number is in sync with the 153 mentions of the Tetragrammaton, the abbreviation of God's name, Yehovah, yud heh vav heh Yet the four-letter word for God appears in the Hebrew version of the Old Testament at least 6,828 times, as found in the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia version. In conclusion, since scripture proves scripture, for me, the meaning of the 153 fish can be taken from the next passage, beginning in verse 15 of our passage, wherein it says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? 
Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. And who were his sheep? Those whom the apostles and all of the evangelists who would follow them would evangelize and disciple throughout the world and the ages. Jerome proposed that at the time of the miraculous catch of fish, there existed 153 species in the Sea of Galilee, representing all the nations of the world that were to be evangelized. The very idea that the disciples caught the greatest amount of fish they ever had well symbolizes the great harvest of souls they would reap during their lifetimes and that would continue to be reaped by those who would succeed them in preaching the gospel throughout the centuries until now. Like the first miraculous catch of fish in Luke 5, in which Jesus foretold his disciples at the beginning of his ministry that they would be catches of men, the second miraculous catch at the end of his ministry was to remind them of that calling, which Matthew clarified in his gospel. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19. Thank you for viewing this presentation and be blessed in every area of your lives as you study God's word to learn of him and his plan and purpose for your life.